Good afternoon, everyone. Please forgive the delay. There were some unavoidable technical difficulties. Welcome to our session on opportunities and challenges in digital transformation, digital literacy and inclusivity, and data privacy. I'm Dr. Rafael A. Guerrero, the Dean of the School of Science and Engineering and ERDT project leader of the Ateneo de Manila University. To maintain the flow of the program, I will now introduce all of our guest speakers before they make their presentations. Our first speaker on digital literacy is the director of the DICT ICT Literacy and Competency Development Bureau. Attorney Alvin M. Navarro is the Assistant Secretary for Digital Capability and Transformation, facilitating the mission delivery of the ICT's three bureaus in charge of training, industry development, and government digital transformation. Educated at the University of the Philippines, he has close to 15 years of governance experience, having held positions in housing, finance, environment, justice, and intellectual property sectors. In the private space before joining DICT, he has advised IT startups and enterprises on legal and strategic matters. Good afternoon, Attorney Navarro. Our second speaker will talk to us about digital inclusivity. He is the executive director of the Rosalino S. Navarro Policy Center for Competitiveness, Dr. Jamil Paolo S. Francisco. Dr. Francisco is an associate professor of economics at the Asian Institute of Management. He currently serves as interim school head of the Stephen Zwellig Graduate School of Development Management. He is also the executive director of the EIM Rizalino S. Navarro Policy Center for Competitiveness. He served as associate dean of AIM from 2018 to 2021. As an associate professor of economics, he teaches business economics, environmental scanning analysis, and Asian business systems for the MBA, Master in Development Management, Master of Entrepreneurship, and Executive Education programs. Prior to joining the AIM, Dr. Francisco was a lecturer at the Ateneo de Manila University. He had led several research projects under the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, and the International Development Research Center's Economy and Environment Program for Southeast Asia. Good afternoon, Dr. Francisco. Our third talk is on data privacy by the Policy Advisor for Information Society Service, National Privacy Commission, Mr. Jansen C. Esguera. Mr. Esguera is an ICT advocate and currently serves in the Philippine government as an information technology officer in the Data Security and Technology Standards Division of the National Privacy Commission. With the mandate of upholding the rights of privacy and protecting the personal information of Philippine citizens. In NPC, the core of his work includes the development of ISO standards in identifying management and privacy technology through the Bureau of Philippine Standards as co-editor of work projects that can potentially emerge as international ISO standards. Good afternoon, Mr. Esguera. Our session today will be moderated by Mr. Orlando Oxales, who has been a staunch advocate for digital transformation since he was in government serving as director three for technical services in the Department of Education until 1995. Since then, he rejoined the private sector as a communications professional and is currently the president of the Strathbase Research Institute. As part of their advocacy initiatives, he and a group of legal and academic professionals organized consumer, consumer advocacy group Citizen Watch Philippines and serves as its lead convenor in engaging both government and the private sector in developmental policy reforms and good governance. Mr. Oxales is also a senior advisor of international think tank Bauer Group Asia and is a columnist of the Manila Standard. Good afternoon, Mr. Oxales. I will now turn over our session to our moderator, Mr. Orlando Oxales. I look forward to 
very informative presentations and a fruitful discussion. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, is everybody hearing me okay? Yeah. Oh, Mr. Oxalis, we just have a reminder from one of our staff members, uh, Ms. Jessica Francisco. Jess? Please continue, please, sir. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, sige. Yeah, right. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Dr. Guerrero. Uh, good afternoon to our uh, panelists of experts today and fellow advocates for digital transformation. Um, uh, we have a very good lineup of topics today. Um, actually, digital transformation is something really um, uh, very close to my heart because it is something I've been working on and really um, uh, as a person and, and professionally uh, uh, a believer in, in, in digital technologies as a very uh, important tool towards our country's development. Um, digital transformation is really on top of mind of every strategy of government and industry leaders nowadays. The big question actually is, are we digitally ready? Are the public and private sectors organizational and policy environments ready for disruptive changes needed to integrate and maximize the benefits of digital solutions for public services and operations? Is the culture of the organization ready? Do you have the right technology? Are your human resources ready to operate these new technologies? Are the millions of users now going online aware of the risks of going to cyberspace? And do they know how to protect themselves from these cyber criminals? These are, I believe, some of the very important prerequisites that must be met to successfully harness the benefits of digitalization. In this session, we will hear attorney Alvin Navarro, who will tackle the topic of digital literacy and how we can engineer the future through digital transformation. How digital, digital literacy is critical to developing our human capital in the emerging digital economy. Our second speaker, Dr. Camille Paolo S. Francisco, will discuss the digital divide that has become even more pronounced, I believe, in this crisis and the need for digital inclusivity, or what I like to call democratized, democratized access to the empowering benefits of digital technologies. Mr. Jansen Esguera Naman, for his part, will, will talk about how data privacy should be a conscious concern, especially now that consumers and sellers have shifted to online platforms for purchases and financial transactions. And of course, the dominance of social media for personal interactions and information because of its accessibility and richness of content. He'll be discussing our current policy environment on data privacy and how this should be integrated in enterprise and individual online behavior. After the speakers, hopefully we will have some time for an open forum for any additional insights you may have or you may want from our panel of experts. So great. Um, I won't uh, take any much more time and let's listen to our first speaker. Um, I'd like to turn over now to our first speaker, attorney Alvin Navarro, the DICT Assistant Secretary for digital capability and transformation. Attorney Navarro. Thank you, Sir Orly. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, permission to share my screen, please.
can you see can you see my screen yes. thank you yes we can all right when we talk of um digital transformation sir orley has mentioned the critical component of human capital and so we have to have measures as a nation to reskill or upskill our people with regard to ICT. I will talk about the initiatives of the ICT with regard to digital literacy and inclusivity. What were relatively ideas just before? Work from home, e-government services, online and blended learning, e-commerce, with the advent of the pandemic, suddenly entered our vocabulary of everyday lives. Now, this is the new normal for us. And how do we adapt to its exponential demands? At the ICT, we have adapted the CHIP framework to drive digital transformation. The CHIP stands for Connect, Harness, Innovate, and protect. Obviously, the connect requires the building of the digital infrastructure foundation of the country. Necessarily, it will involve the laying of fiber optics and making sure that there are wireless technologies. It's now being done. The harness part involves making an investment in digital education. This is where we will focus today, in the skills and the digital jobs. The innovate part refers to expanding the digital government and business services. And finally, as we go closer into aggressively participating in the new global economy, new risks arise. That is why we have the component protect. It seeks to mitigate the risks in a digital economy. Now, how do we harness human capital? The DICT has adopted a five-pronged approach. First, we seek to provide ICT training and certification for competitiveness. In the ICT training space, if before the method was face-to-face, -face, right now we have shifted to developing massive open online courses, which targets to reach tens of thousands of public sector employees and at the same time, private individuals. We are also offering globally recognized ICT certifications. Now let's go to development of government chief information officers. Sadly, the government bureaucracy in its entirety cannot boast of ICT professionals who are part of executive and strategic team. Generally, they are seen as mere troubleshooters. Pang may problema, for example, yung equipment sa kasi maalala. What we did is to conceive a program wherein GCIOs will be developed. In fact, we partnered with UP 
and we are providing master's deg degree in technology management to go national government agencies and some local government units. The third approach is to upskill the local workforce, raise ICT-based entrepreneurs, and foster smart cities. The fourth approach, of course, is to foster digital citizenship and inclusivity. While we deliver ICT learning to ICT professionals in government, we make it a point that we support ICT in education, we promote cyber safe, and we do not forget the vulnerable sectors, the PWDs and senior citizens. Finally, our fifth approach consists of establishing digital transformation centers. This involves a venue where people from all walks of life can come to and access equipment and content. We have these tech for ed centers, which is on a smaller scale. The digital transformation center, in partnership with with the intellect, uh, with the International Telecommunications Union have also innovation hubs to support ICT-based um, entrepreneurship ecosystem. So it will have presence in 100% of the provinces, at least 50% of the cities. It will provide access to ICT equipment, connectivity, and online training, and ultimately face-to-face -face training. It features innovation hubs, labs for programming, content creation, networking. It can also serve as co-working space and library. Now, let's define digital literacy. It's the ability to find, to evaluate, to utilize, share and create content using information technologies and of course the internet. What are our specific digital literacy measures? These are the digital learners and teachers program, the digital workforce through the ICT Academy, and as I mentioned, the digital transformation centers. What have we done under these measures? Under the digital learners and teachers, we have developed ICT modules to help our teachers upskill themselves and be comfortable in the use of ICTs in their teaching. And for learners, we have especially targeted the adults wherein contents have been developed and ultimately will be delivered to them. We have developed modules also for cyber safety for K to 12. We have partnership development for the skills window platform to facilitate skills and career matching. Now under the digital workforce, as I mentioned, we are going to develop government chief information officers. And we are doing this by offering scholarships. Right now we have 70 uh, master students from the NGAs and the LGUs. Of course, we are expanding courses to include information security, cybersec, emerging and transform transformative technologies. Under the DTCs, we are upgrading about 2,000 operational tech for end centers, which will mushroom all over the Philippines. Now that will be, that is the end of my presentation. Marami salamat po sa inyo. Back to you, Sir Ordi.
Hello, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Asik Navarro. Uh, I, I really like uh, your discussion when you said that uh, um, digital literacy it, it, uh, is really very fundamental in how we're going to go about this this uh, this digital transformation and also. Uh, it was quite interesting when you said that uh, you will be developing the government CIOs. Um, that's uh, during my time when, when I was in government, that was non non-existent. And I, I, in my observation now, that's still going to be a challenge because um, knowing the qualified CIOs we have around, uh, just in terms of compensation, we have some issues there. So it, it, we, we, it, the problem is really both policy and and organizational, I believe. Thank you very much for that talk. Um, next, um, next we have uh, to talk about um, we, our second speaker, Dr. Hamil Paolo S. Francisco, will discuss the digital divide. Uh, this is something that really happened uh, uh, during this pandemic, and it's very evident. And uh, it happened especially in the education sector, uh, as uh, most of us have children and, um, and the access to the, and even uh, knowing how to use the technology for both teachers, the students and the parents is a problem. So uh, I'd like to turn over the session to Dr. Francisco. Thank you very much, Mr. Oxalis. Glad to be part of this panel. So I'm just gonna quickly share my screen. All right, um, well, obviously by now, uh, uh, we know how this pandemic has affected not just the way we work, the way, as Mr. Rosales had mentioned, the way we study, the way many of us here who are teachers also um, conduct our classes. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the key skills now, the skills of the 21st century apparently is how to mute and unmute oneself. <laughs> and to share slides uh, or to uh, view the chat box uh, during these presentations. Um, but, you know, I, I guess among the optimists, <laughs> uh, there is this lingering question of, you know, in the last 18, I, I, I've lost count, 18 months um, since the beginning of this pandemic, is there at all something to speak of as a silver lining, a digital silver lining? Perhaps, and 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 that's what that's the question that I think uh, a lot of us want to talk about today. And also, um, I'm also being conscious of uh, our audience here being, you know, engineers, right, scientists uh, who have a critical role to play in developing the technologies um, and really sticking true to what technology really means. And that is, you know, something that enables people to make use of these developments in science and research um, to practical things and things that really matter for life, for work, for play, um, for study. So um, first, I want to put some numbers to the obvious. <laughs> um, whenever we say digital transformation, uh, you know, uh, really the first thing that tends to come to our minds is social media. And for some time, that was something you know, we would be ashamed of that uh, that's all we know, social media. Um, but I suppose as this pandemic uh, has proven to us, social media is perhaps deeper than what we thought it was in terms of being a platform, not just as being the only means now, if you think about it, to connect and have a sense of community, um, but also to drive action among people, right? Uh, but social media has also proven itself to be a very important platform for e-commerce, whether for the actual transactions of e-commerce or simply the uh, providing of information as to the options available um, through e-commerce. So having said that, I think this is stating the obvious. Uh, this is some data that I just picked up um, from uh, uh, secondary sources of how about 81% supposedly of Filipinos have access to social media. And on average, Filipinos spend greater than four hours a day now on social media. Uh, I know there is a joke about how that might be because the internet is slow and so it takes you longer to, to go through the social media site. Um, but you know, that simply means that perhaps during this pandemic, this has also been a primary outlet for us for engagement and involvement. 
For sure, we love our social media. I mean, you already know what these social media outfits are. Uh, Filipinos um, are watching YouTube. They are they are on Facebook. They are chatting. They are communicating through Messenger, right? They're on Instagram. They're on they're on Twitter. They're on TikTok, right? And I suppose what this really tells us is that you know Filipinos are active one socially. But as many of you are very well aware of your own behavior at this point, Filipinos are also now very active online economically, meaning in terms of transactions, in buying stuff from groceries to makeup, um, to services, right, to training programs. And uh, it, 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 it's, such a, it's such a boon for people and companies that have taken advantage of digitalization that, oh, you know, 18 months ago, this target segment, Right, this customer persona might have shunned anything digital. Right, I mean, you know, we all have a parent or a tito or maybe even ourselves who, in the past, would say, "No, I am not a fan of digital mobile banking. No, I'm not a fan of e-commerce. Of course, I can't buy my fresh meats and seafood um, through my cell phone. Of course, that doesn't make sense at all." Educators who would say. You know, online is just not for us because we can't do it. Nothing beats face-to-face. But 18 months after, we have changed our habits. And that's major. A lot of people are saying that, you know, money is a good way to, to measure the votes of people called people's confidence and behavior. And the fact that, the, that, that so many of these people, of course, there are some limitations to this online survey that Satista is referring to because this is a survey among people who are already online. Um, but at least among the people who are online, this is telling us that indeed the majority of people, or not a majority, sorry, but a sizable chunk of them um, are actually now economically active online rather than in physical stores among Filipinos. So... Then if that's the case, I don't have to talk any further because that means everyone is online. Digital transformation is inclusive. End of the conversation. 77% according to this, again, statistic, right? Um, uh, from the ITU, right? Tells us that ah, majority of Filipinos have some form of access to the internet. Now, yeah, on paper, we know that digital inclusion or, the, or, or access to the internet can mean so many of these things for Filipinos. Information, um, news, what's going on, right? Uh, what's going on in the rest of the world. Entertainment, right? And I'm not even going to speak now about um, uh, broadcast television, but with, with the choices um, you know, being less than it was before, then sources of entertainment have also been online. But something also which perhaps warrants a little bit more attention also is how the online environment has also become a platform for political action and civic engagement. Uh, we've seen this among our kids, our youth, right, who in the past, uh, you know, were, 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 were politically agnostic, if you want. And now say what we want about how people are just active online, but not in real life. Um, you know, I, I, anecdotally, I've seen people who've come out, registered, who've done their civic duties precisely because of the political action and movement that's happening online. And of course, e-commerce, right? So many small businesses uh, would swear that they would have gone out of business if not for e-commerce. And I'm not just talking about your marketplaces, Shopee, Lazada, but also you know, just being able to connect with potential customers, whether on Insta, in, uh, uh, instant messaging apps, right? Um, or even just getting you know, um, deliveries through uh, many of our new delivery services. Now, again, if anything, fine. Um, and, and I'm glad that ASEC Navarro is also here. Uh, we have government, the ICT, we have different uh, local governments as well that have um, you know, accelerated their efforts in e-governance. So we've seen this and we've seen how digital inclusion can mean a lot for Filipinos. But in my view, we're, we're, we're really just scratching the surface because again, on paper, the potential is huge. And I'm gonna start with economic participation right away there. Because even in this world of lockdowns where we are not able to physically go our, out, or even if we are allowed to, if we don't have the confidence to go out because we're afraid of the virus, then the only alternative does seem to be digital. 
and judging as well from the number of people who have gone to, you know, they put up their now their new sushi bake um, businesses or all of these, uh, you know, home kitchen businesses. That anecdotally, there's so many entrepreneurship opportunities which seem to be opened up because of going digital. Of course, we can't also not talk about digital payments. And again, if you just simply look at the numbers, you will look at the numbers of PayMaya, Gcash, and all of these other outfits. You have a huge acceleration. Things, trends, which they believe would have happened only five or eight years down the line have happened all of a sudden in the first five or eight months of this pandemic. So it seems that there's a lot you can do. And many Filipinos, businesses, government has appreciated this fact that we can do so much if we actually transform digitally. But I'd also want us to knock ourselves in the head <laughs> and really ask the question, yeah, like, sure, yeah, the pandemic has changed a lot of our digital habits. But has it really? And, and, and this is not to put blame on any sector or any agency or anyone in particular. But, you know, looking out there or, or if you actually just listen to the stories of other people, the other side, so to speak, then we will be shocked perhaps by the reality that as much as we, perhaps in this circle, precisely because we are watching this Zoom webinar, um, are digitally enabled, uh, so many of the things that we do still aren't. And, and here's a photo, a stock photo that I got um, from a granted taken in August of one of those lines in one of these LGUs distributing Ayuda, right? And we've heard this many times of how this might have been avoided if we had already employed some sort of digital payment system or if mobile money and all of these e-wallet and all of these other services had already been more um, widely accepted. And there are many cases of developing countries, in fact, less developed uh, than ours, that have already done that in the past. Uh, coulda, shoulda, woulda, right? But what this tells us is that there is indeed, as Mr. Oxalis had mentioned, a divide. Um, we had a survey uh, of about 700 plus firms in NCR and Calabarzon during the pandemic, and we asked them about their shift to e-commerce. And hey, I'm looking at, an increase from moderate and high to very high adoption from 12 to 18% of respondents comparing uh, two survey um, observations uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and a few, months, uh, a few months ago. We're seeing it for digital marketing with efforts moving to social media, right? Instead of putting up those banners and tarpaulins in their shops. We've seen some adoption in digital payment as well. And, and I'm seeing that positive increase in the last two columns, right? Of moderate and high participation or adoption by firms. So there's an upward trend. And yet, of course, we have to highlight as well that still the majority have not been able to make that shift. Uh, we had a chance to talk to SMEs to find out, okay, in, in some of these qualitative um, uh, FGDs and key informant interviews. Of, of, so why aren't they transforming digitally? And one of the stories, which at first, in my view, would be like, you know, if you hear that transcript, you will say, you will, might be judgmental of this entrepreneur and say that, okay, this entrepreneur is so um, resistant to change. And it's funny because this entrepreneur that we interviewed was around the early 30s. I would, suppo I would suppose, stereotypically, you would say tech savvy. But his response to, okay, why haven't you been adopting digitally? Why aren't you on Lazada or Shopee? For me, really highlights the point. And he said, because really when, when you think about it, there's so many things and changes that you have to make in your business to really go digital. And a lot of our SMEs are beginning to find that out, maybe the hard way, that sure, you've put up your Lazada or, or Shopee mall shop or whatever. But you know, when you go e-commerce, that means number one, you're opening yourself to competition, not just locally, your neighborhood, your barangay, but to every single provider in the archipelago, maybe even outside, overseas. Number two, they have to deal now with deliveries, which come and go, and who's gonna do that in their shop? They have to deal with somebody being familiar, how to take photographs, that's what this SME said, right? They have so many merchandise, but each of these have to have good photographs. And that is a cost for SMEs. And they don't even know how to do it and, and, and do it well. 
And true enough, maybe this is one of our conservative respondents. But for me, that echoes what a lot of businesses and individuals face. I mean, some of them have been lucky enough to actually have their foot in the door. But as you also know, even education, there are people who are left behind simply because digital transformation is not as simple as internet access, nor is it as simple as having a, you know, an account in any of these social media. We already know this. I'm just giving you some data because I know you, you, the scientists would appreciate this data <laughs> and economists as well. Um, you know, this is showing a general trend. There's an increase in digital access from 2006 to 2019, but the gap between NCR and the rest of the zone, the rest of the zone besides Mindanao is there. And again, we also see that in terms of how this digital divide does reflect the wealth gaps across our region. And this digital divide also affects telework-ability. And just quickly, I'm going to uh, talk about this, this slide here. Of, of we, 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 we looked at different job descriptions available in the Philippines and, and look at how teleworkable they are. Um, and what this is basically showing is that although you have the dif differences across ages, and that's something you want to highlight, for me, what is highlightable here is if you look at the percent of jobs that are non-teleworkable, it's still a whole lot. And this is a function of two things. On the one hand, the nature of the jobs, but two also because of the kind of jobs that people have, right? Um, which simply means that, again, people like you and I perhaps are lucky enough to be able to work from home productively because of telework and digitalization. But there will always be people who will not be able to. And that's a function of skills, as Asak Navarro had mentioned. Sure, greater education, will probably land you a job that is teleworkable. And that's what this 43% tells us versus the 15, 7, and 4% of lower degrees or, or, or not being able to get a college degree. Uh, uh, but it still also tells us that even people among college graduates are in jobs which are not easily teleworkable. And if you add the lens of income, again, it highlights how telework which is one of our new signs or, 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 or descriptors of, of digital transformation, still not available to those economically vulnerable. And I'm gonna end soon. I'm saying that opportunities abound. We keep talking opportunistically about how we need to develop and create a new better normal for everyone, for proactive e-government, for citizen engagement, for creating a more level playing field. It's that one chance for small business to go head to head with a big business when they go to e-commerce, access to markets, access to resources and all of this. But support is needed for those lagging behind and there's a lot. Of this. Um, we always speak of a digital ecosystem. And for me, these are three important areas that we have to work with if we truly want digital inclusion. It's not just a matter of getting prices low enough so that everyone has mobile access uh, and digital access or internet access. It's not just a matter of, of laying down our broadband infrastructure to make it literally available to everyone. But today, Apple had released, or, or just yesterday, they had launched a set of new Apple products that they've come up with. And it's always a favorite business case study of how Apple has created an ecosystem among its products, a phone, a watch, an iPad, iCloud services, right, iTunes, so that you will never leave. It's a walled garden. I want to use that same analogy, that in order for just like you Apple fans there who feel like you cannot live without Apple, if we are ready to take advantage of digital transformation, it has to be an ecosystem approach. Everything has to move together, the hardware, and the software. And that's where intelligence comes in, the digital skills we're talking about, and the mindset and willingness to think. Because when you digitally transform, it isn't just signing up for a cloud service. It is about how to change the business practices you do and the institutions necessary to make that happen. I'm going to end with this example in the education sector. In July this year, Harvard Business School and MIT announced the sale of Harvard Business School and MIT's EdX platform, which is their internet education EdTech platform. It was sold by, to about eight, by about $800 million to an EdTech firm. And what does that represent? That represents that it seems that the money is going to EdTech. 
And that edtech means that that's a transformation in the way we do education. Um, you know, not all schools and universities have the same endowments as the Harvards and MITs of the world that can afford on-campus facilities, expensive academic theaters and all of that. And online is the next solution that could possibly uh, make the access to education easier for everyone. But is it an easy transformation? No, we're finding it the hard way, even in the Philippines. Um, is it cheap? Maybe not. But is it worth the effort? Well, if our problem had always been we have too few teachers for our students, we don't have the money to build classrooms, then perhaps a digital solution is the only solution to really bring development to the farthest reach of the archipelago. So um, I'll end with that. Thank you very much. I think I did go over time about two minutes, being mindful of that, um, Mr. Rosales. But uh, thank you very much for your patience. I'd, I'd be glad to join the forum later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Francisco. Yeah. Ah, yeah, he really illustrated um, uh, the topic about the situation. There is a digital divide. And really, to address it, it's well, the infrastructure problem is just for me the it's probably the most in, uh, the most the easiest step because uh, infrastructure is there. All it needs is investment and to get it out there. And the, the second one would probably I believe is more challenging is, is the intelligence uh, with with the devices and the technology we have. It, it's really uh, being able to uh, educate our population to be able to wield that technology. Um, you are, I totally agree with your ecosystem approach. Um, uh, it cannot be, uh, as you said, you, you gave an example about Apple, well, I'm not an Apple guy. Uh, ec ecosystem approach is really the best way to go because the, 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 the nature, you're, you're right when, when you were starting to talk about um how uh, how 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 different situations are for different people and how different it should be handled it really illustrates the big challenge of how we should go about this uh, inclusivity in terms of digitalization and that very interesting last point about education about investments going to ed tech is also very interesting, which I hope you can further discuss later. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, for our next speaker, uh, we have Mr. Jansen Esguera, Esguera, the Policy Advisor for Information Society Service of the National Privacy Commission, who's going to talk about a very important topic, which is um, which we are all at risk. It's, it's about uh, data privacy. Especially with the, the way we're 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 instantly trusting these technologies online and going online like mad, um, uh, this is something we should be wary about. So, um, turning over to you, Mister Sierra. Hi, sir Ordi. So, uh, thank you, thank you for that. Um, may I confirm first if uh, if my audio is clear, or if is there any background noise? Uh, it's all right. Okay. Um, permission to share my screen. All right. So uh, for for the next topic, I'll be talking about data privacy. So um, yeah. So whenever we uh, we talk data privacy in the context of uh, digital transformation, we always think that it's a double-edged sword, right? So we, as a uh, professor from uh, as uh, professor Francisco has shared a while ago, we we saw the date the actual data, the adoption of uh, digital measures and technology, which of course is a boon for uh, for us here in adapting the new normal. Of course, the ICT uh, is our uh, is our mother agency. So, for this one, so I, uh, they are the ones who are mandated to, of course, promote the ICT use in 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 our country. 
right? So as as uh, as uh, the director of the ICT has mentioned a while ago, they have multiple projects which will enable uh, the adoption of uh, ICT in the country. So we are also glad to hear the message of support of uh, Secretary Honasan providing the the our duty to protect or promote cybersecurity and data privacy. Of course, techno the use of technology do not come without risks. I always imagine, uh, I always imagine, uh, as I previously mentioned, that it is a double-edged sword. So usually, people are people are the ones who put morality in the technology, right? So, so uh, I remember the issue that uh, the food panda or the grab drivers. Uh, some malicious individuals are placing fake orders right while we welcome while we welcome those uh, services being provided to us there are some uh, malicious actors who who abuse the platform so you can answer in the chat who led your digital transformation feel free to use the zoom chat so ceo the chief executive officer uh, Chief Information Officer, B, CIO, C, Chief Technology Officer, or COVID-19. So, uh, Director Navarro has mentioned the chip framework a while ago, but I usually talk, begin this uh, talk with uh, with uh, digital transformation uh, with a joke, right? So, it was COVID-19 who, who spearheaded, who forced us to adapt to digital uh, measures, right? Because uh, our physical way of doing things are, are risky because of the pandemic. And when we, when we talk about this, we usually put it into context that we post a question to the audience, which is more valuable, data or money. So uh, Director Francisco a while ago uh, has mentioned that there's an EdTech platform which was uh, which was bought, of course, from Harvard, and of course, when whenever a big sale like that has occurred, you may think that it's a it's an investment that would be profitable in the future. So that uh, it will be it's a cost that they are willing to take because of the return of investments that is foreseen. Right. So, in the context of Apple or the big tech companies, Facebook. Grab Google Lazada. We all know that. We all know that they they are they, they have no. Uh, for example, uh, Grab. They have no taxis or vehicles of their own. The vehicles are owned by the drivers or the or the ones who are uh, transporting people, providing transport services to people. Lazada just provided the platform. They do not have an own inventory. So it's a platform where sellers can post their products for selling. Google has uh, initially they have uh, they just provided an indexing of the of the of the files in the internet as a search engine. And Facebook has no content of their own. They provided just a platform. So the users are the one who are generating the pictures, the posts, the videos, right? So we, we all know that they have had a resounding success in the use of technology. So going back to the question, which is more, uh, which is more valuable, data or money, I leave, that, I leave that question to you because surely they answer money. But of course, in, in the context of these uh, companies, they had, uh, they had huge success and uh, more money, right? Yeah, so yeah, data has been more important, and of course, technology is more. Uh, uh, the use of technology is more apparent in this uh, in this uh, age, right? So data is the new oil. So we have previously had we had uh, an uh, uh, an industry revolution, right? So uh, we're in the fourth industrial revolution as uh, as they had quoted. So where, where data will be the new oil. So yeah, in the context of the big companies, big tech companies a while ago. 
So when we talk about data privacy, there's the fact that there is no Tagalog or Filipino counterpart for this word. So this may this might be an alien concept to some, but of course, uh, as data have as as the data has been uh, presented a while ago, uh, I saw social media use in the Philippines has uh, has been uh, is is more apparent. Or we are we are once the text capital of the world, right? Because of our use of SMS. Now I think we can be. I saw a study that Philippines has the most average use of social media. Uh, average use of uh, average time spent on social media so in that case uh, we are we are naturally uh, open yeah so privacy may be a a foreign concept because this has been a this has been adapted from the our european uh, counterparts right so yeah, it's just, it just means that a freedom from intrusion to the private life or affairs of an individual as defined in an ISO standard. So we also have this dissenting opinion of Justice Consuelo Inares Santiago versus the Director General of the NEDA before, where they define information privacy as the individual's ability to control the flow of information overbalanced by legitimate public concerns. So when it is important to note that privacy is not always uh, confidentiality or secrecy. So that's a domain of it. But it's important to note that control is the most important uh, uh, area of uh, data privacy. Where, where, me as, uh, where me as an individual, I have the control whether to post my picture, for example, on social media or to select a few audience where in I can control uh, who can see my posts, right? So we have this 21st century law to protect, of course, 21st century threats. So we have data privacy. So Data Privacy Act of 2012 was, uh, was uh, signed and promulgated in 2012. So it's an act to protect personal information in information communication systems. Uh, in the government and private sector. So not just only information and communication systems, this may also include the pen and paper processing. Right? So in this case, uh, the National Privacy Commission, the government agency mandated to implement this law is created. So it's always a balance. So when we say, uh, when we say data privacy, it's, it's declared in its declaration of policy that it balances the duties of the state to bal to protect the individual right to privacy and the free flow of information towards innovation and growth. Of course, it uh, it was acknowledged that ICT has uh, has a fundamental role in nation building. Right. So, just because it has uh, it has uh, a, a certain technology. For a certain processing uh, entails entails uh, high risk doesn't mean we are not allowed to do it so we always think of big technologies uh, we always balance it in a risk-based manner so the right to privacy versus the free flow of information so uh, as we have mentioned a while ago it's the right to be let alone as defined in iso and it's the individual's ability to control the flow of information but we also have to balance it against uh, public interests such as freedom of the press for research and development and the right to freedom of information okay. so it's a, always a balancing act so so the scope of the data privacy, of course, when uh, it concerns personal information, when a certain uh, when a certain aggregate or when an aggregate of information does not contain personal information, then it is beyond the scope of the data privacy act. So we have these uh, three main actors. We uh, the, the scope of the D3A is limited to processing of personal information. We have those who process personal information. We have the data subjects, 
whose personal information is processed. And we have the regulator, the government agency that regulates the processing of personal information. So we have to uphold the rights of the data subject. First, when 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 we when we process personal information, we have to provide uh, we have to provide data subjects on how can they exercise their rights. So if you notice, when companies update their privacy policies, they ask you to uh, to read and uh, ask you to agree to uh, to their privacy policy so that they can adequately inform you of uh, of their processes. So we also have the right to object wherein you can object to the processing of your personal information. For example, you receive an unsolicited call. Of course, they, got, they may have gotten your data elsewhere, right? So you can, uh, you can opt out of that. Of course, you can also request access uh, to, to the organization that uh, processes your personal data. When there's any error, uh, for example, your, your your the name your name is spelled is misspelled, you can you can have it amended. First, just to you should provide the, uh, the supporting documents or official government documents to back up the correction. You also have the the right to be blocked or removed from from a filing system, and of course as to uh, to support also the right to access the right to data portability provides uh, provides the the provision that you can obtain an electronic copy of your data in a common and a digital format of course when any of these uh, data privacy rights are violated data subjects are are able to file a complaint and of course, to be to be indemnified uh, or to be covered uh, against the harm or loss that was uh, inflicted. So, as I review, this is the general data privacy principle. So, uh, the one who processes your personal information must demonstrate transparency. They should uh, they should let you know on on how on what is the extent of the processing of your personal information they should have uh, they, they should have legitimate purpose so one of the means by which they have the legitimate purpose is to get your consent and of course if there's a government mandate to do it so they can process your personal information for example the land transportation office processes our name our blood type our address our age of course because they are mandated to to provide a driver's license. Right? And of course, proportionality, we must not collect more than it is necessary. For example, should not, one should not collect excessive or personal information that is not, uh, that is, that is not needed. Right? And of course, this is the, when we talk about data privacy, this is usually support, so, uh, this is usually the relationship between security and data privacy. So you cannot have you cannot have privacy without security, but you cannot but you can have security without privacy. So the security domain, uh, of course, is uh, is the, the main concern of the info information security domain is the protection of information. If there's no personal information, again, that's beyond the scope of data privacy. If you protect, if an organization protects uh, information in ICT, so that's cybersecurity. So again, if there's no personal information involved, so that's uh, that's beyond the scope of data privacy. And data privacy refers to the protection of personal information, be it in manual, be it in analog form or in digital form or in ICT. So. We enjoy the uh, companies are required to uh, to comply with the Data Privacy Act. Or of course, uh, not only companies but also us in the government. So they should have at least these five basic pillars. They must have 
they, they must have complied with this one. Of course, first is to appoint a data protection officer. A data protection officer should uh, is the champion for data privacy and implements the data data privacy see policies in the uh, organization. The second pillar refers to conducting a risk assessment in terms of privacy. So ideally, before you roll out a program, a process, or a system, one should have taken into account your compliance to privacy and the risks that are inherent in the processing of personal information. The third pillar refers to the authoritative document providing the privacy manual and the implementation of your privacy measures, which is uh, detailed in the fourth pillar. So the third one is the document, the fourth one is the implementation. And of course, the fifth pillar, uh, like, like how we prepare for any disaster like earthquakes and fires, usually uh, when we are, uh, when we, when we when the, when there's a breach in data privacy when our system are hacked we cannot control uh, we cannot control that incident from happening but of course we can have proactive steps in responding to it so it's important to exercise the breach procedures so i recall i recall we we did a tabletop exercise so the tabletop exercise was uh, it's a good simulation in creating a fictional uh, data breach wherein you can wherein you can test your breach procedures so for example if we do not have data privacy in our in our if it's if it's if if this concept is alien to us they will they will have uh, they, they may be abuses in sharing our personal information. For example, uh, Maria Ozawa is a celebrity. So this, she is a famous celebrity and uh, she, slammed, she slammed the TNV drivers for stalking and sharing her personal number. Of course, she got unsolicited messages and calls, right? So because of the sharing of the num the, her mobile number. Another another proud moment where, wherein a teacher who who just passed a uh, the licensure exam for teachers posted his or her P PRC ID online. So unknowingly that ID was used to apply for a debt. So so, so maybe one of his friends in social media did it, right? So so that's uh we should be mindful of uh of this uh of this uh our posting of personal information for example unknowingly he he accumulated a total of eight hundred thousand in salary loans right so so wherein he he was he was not aware right so his you his identity was stolen because of uh the posting of his uh, prc id so in closing Privacy is a key for technologies and protecting rights. So the National Privacy Commission supports the successful use of digital technologies and processing of personal data in a manner that is effective and preserves and protects the data privacy rights of individuals. So uh, thank you for having me and uh, this ends my slides. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our friend from uh, National Privacy Commission. Uh, that was very important, uh, uh, sir, for for give those those insights. Um, I I I'm actually very worried every time I I order something either on a on a on a free free market platform online or sometimes even in some Viber groups, and you have to give all of this information by messaging and really uh, it's it's kind of worrying and well when you do those things you get what you deserve you get all of these calls all of these unsolicited mes messages um i think uh, do we have some time for some a few questions yes 
So um, we'll open the floor for um, an open forum. Um, we'll entertain a few questions and uh, please do use, feel free to use the, the Q&A Q um, feature of Zoom. Um, to start off, uh, I'd like to uh, ask our speakers, I, I believe Dr. Francisco had, had to go. Well, it is the reality of things. Sometimes your meetings are so tight, you have to jump from one Zoom meeting to another. Um, I'd like our, our remaining speakers to um, give us your insights. Um, given that right now we're in the pandemic situation and you've seen two years of this crisis and, and uh, all of these shifts and to, to digital and everybody trying to adjust and trying to cope. And I would think that you would have some insights on uh, the, the possible gaps that we have right now in terms of, uh, well, let me put it this way. If you were, for example, appointed to a cabinet position and were asked by the new president, in terms of digital transformation and to bring us to become competitive in a digital econ economy, to compete with a globally global digital economy, what should we do? What should we do in terms of infrastructure, policy, uh, organization? So give, give me your thoughts on that. Take it from the purview of, of, of your organization and uh, of course the, the industry or the sector that, that, that you're, that you're uh, mandated to handle. Sir Orly? Yeah. Um, let me put in my one cent words. <laughs> uh, if I were to be asked as to what we should do with regard to infra, I think I would uh, urge the president to treat our digital infra as if we're, it is also our physical infrastructure because for many decades we have neglected to build to build up our digital infra and look where we are now even vietnam is poised to be ahead of us we have this legacy infra and it's about time that we pour in the resources that we need to really build up our national broadband infra, that's one. Now with regard to policy, first let's talk about the data um, of each of the government agencies. Right now the challenge is essentially gover government data is siloed, meaning we, we could not really have all of the systems of the government seamlessly talk to each other and come up with, uh, the, with a way, for example, to synthesize our knowledge of what we have. It's about time that we have to make use of government data to really come up with a stable long-term plan. If other of our neighboring countries, for example, can put up a 30-year plan, a 40-year plan. I think it's about time that we do it, and those plans will have to be informed of the data that we have. Now, with regard to the organization, I will have to focus on the ICT team of each government agency. As I mentioned to you, and you know, right, that we do not have the CIOs worthy of the name. Of course, it's not their fault. It's just that I guess the programs, the policies are not in place, but it's one of the positive things that have come out of this pandemic. The ICT, the national ICT agenda has been brought to the fore of consciousness of the public. And not just the public, thankfully, also of our leaders. So 
we have to develop this. We have to de develop a cadre of well-credentialed government CIOs that will drive our digital transformation. So I hope, uh, uh, well, that's my wish list. Yeah. Sir or Rolly. Yeah. Thank you, Attorney Navarro. Uh, let's hear your insight, Mr. Mr. Esquera. Yes, I totally agree with Director Navarro. Uh, uh, for example, uh, for example, when we this the infrastructure policy and organization must go hand in hand. For example, when we have a policy that mandates the 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 boosting, for example, of the bandwidth or the internet connectivity in a nationwide scale, our infrastructure should keep up, right? Or, and, uh, or else the policy could not be realized or will be, will be brought to a later time for implementation. For example, I, I, can, see, I can see the rejection of subdivisions for telcos to put up their infrastructure, right? Because they are, they are fearing the use of 5G that it could cause health problems because of the radiation of the invisible uh, electromagnetic waves emitted by the by this new technology and of course there's this uh there's this policy that enables the common tower policy so it's a sharing of infrastructure between between these telcos because we all know for the longest time we we have we only have a duopoly of telcos the the, the smart group and the globe group uh, now, with the, with the introduction of a new major player, first uh, spearheaded by the DICT and the NTC, we hope to level the playing field. Yes. So in that example, uh, our both the ICT infrastructure and the policy should go hand in hand. For example, we have our national ID law, which was promulgated last uh, 2018. So if if there's a policy uh, that uh, that can drive the use or the implementation of our national ID, then if our ICT systems or the implementer, which is the Philippine Statistics Authority, is uh, is not yet ready, then of course it can take uh, take a significant amount of time, but uh, it could it can be realized. Uh, it is important that we have this. Uh, common appreciation of uh, ICT that it can be used for good. Of course, laws are here to protect us. It should be checked and balanced accordingly. So that's all for me, Mr. Uh, Sir Orgy. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Esquera. Thank you for that. Um, well taken. Um, I I'd like to go back to what, uh, what was mentioned earlier regarding uh, by 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 uh, asec uh, navarro regarding um, investing investing in digital infrastructure um, i i remember that last year the dict actually um, asked for an 18 billion peso budget uh, to to uh, light up the national broadband plan I, i'm quite familiar with it because um, I've been following um, that program ever since because it is really strategically going to be very uh, beneficial nationwide in terms of uh, uh, all of this, this, this uh, increasing access, increasing our speed and all of that. But uh, um, well, we all know that uh, what happened was, was only about 10% was given of your ask, about 1.8 billion, I think. And um, th that's quite sad because I thought that that was a very big missed opportunity. Um, if we had done that, uh, probably we would be more prepared with this pandemic. Um, and um, uh, the DICT will it's itself now plays, uh, plays a very uh, frontline role in terms of uh, spearheading policy and direction of ICT of the country. Uh, with that, um, how is the DICT now trying to ad address this, this, uh, this uh, resource problem? Because I know in Asia, for one thing, 
Um, you're right, Vietnam, um, our other neighbors are spending hundreds of millions of dollars uh, uh, for aggressively for, and they have been doing it for, for many years. And even those that uh, have uh, bandwidths that are that we can only dream of are still uh, investing heavily on infrastructure. And unlike us here, it's it seems like it's the private uh, uh, sector or the telecommunications companies or the players here in the private sector doing all of this building and uh, almost no participation from government investment. Uh, why do you think is that so? Or is that something that's being addressed now, uh, especially now that it's budget season? How's that coming along? Well, first, sir, let me respond to what we're doing now, given the 2021 budget handed to us, right? Um, we, do, we do recognize that it is inadequate. However, what we are do, what we can do is to foster participation from the private sector and the local government units to take a more active role, for example, in building out their LGU broadband. Remember, um, the Mandanas ruling is going to put a lot of resources into the hands of the local government units. So we are going around the country, engaging the chief executive officers of the LGUs in dialogues and trying to persuade them that if you are going to spend in an infra, you might as well take into account building up your digital infra the last mile infra. And of course, our commitment is to build the backbone, bring in cheap internet, at least for the government, and then try to encourage the build up of regional rings that will uh, bring connectivity bandwidth down to the last mile. Now, considering that to respond to your second set of questions, it's budget season now, what we're doing. Of course, sir, we are pushing for a much bigger budget. And in fact, uh, there is a spectrum users fund that we are trying to access or top to augment the regular funds from the GAA in uh, the capital outlay needed for building the, the digital infrastructure. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, um, I think we're just about running out of time. And uh, well, uh, we, we've covered a lot. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, we really appreciate your participation. Um, I, I work with DICT very closely because uh, as Citizen Watch, we're actually partners of the Telecom Tower Watch project of the Secretary, and which we recently launched. And um, it, it, it's something that we we're, we hope will be will make a dent on our uh, digital infrastructure backlog as we try to speed up things in terms of building. But yeah. I cannot really de-emphasize the need for government to do their part because, um, yes, uh, we see all of these investments from the three telcos. They're very aggressive. Uh, I, I can give you that. And, and uh, even uh, international observers see that uh, investments of the Philippines is really up there. But imagine if, we, if it could be complemented and really synced all of these building plans and investments with government uh, funds um, that would really shorten the timeline of our gap and that addresses a lot of it. the first step really is infrastructure the very first step because we cannot go online without uh, first our device and then the signal to make our device uh, run and that when we use it we think it's so simple but it's a 
huge infrastructure behind us. So uh, thank you very much. And, and with that, I, I just have uh, a few short words to close. Uh, I, I'd, I'd, I'd really like to close by uh, going back again with the discussion on the chip, the chip framework that uh, the DICT has adopted from the World Bank. Connect, harness, innovate, and protect. Because it, it really encapsulates uh, a good strategy that uh, government should, uh, should prioritize. Um, to restructure its program towards accelerating digital transformation and boost the country's digital economy. Um, according to the DICT's recent statement that I monitored just a few months ago, I believe, um, CONNECT or the component is focused on building digital infrastructure by firstly establishing a connection to the world through international cable landing stations, which I believe will be launched in a, in a couple of weeks. Uh, the department shall then cascade broadband internet access throughout the country through the building of the national fiber backbone, which is further, I've actually seen it, it's there, we just need to light it up, which is further connected to middle and last mile connections that you have been talking about. Uh, harness component is about the developing about developing the ICT skills of our people. We need to invest in digital education to ensure the readiness of the country's workforce, which is critical in the country's global competitiveness. Considering the problem of the education sector that we've been discussing, um, made worse by this crisis, um, we read in the papers now there's an educational crisis because of this digital divide and difficulty to shift I believe that this part may prove to be the most challenging, most challenging indeed, because it's, it's no longer just about buying and installing devices. It's about changing a mindset, ch changing the paradigm of, of every individual, our managers, our administrators, our leaders, our policy makers. This, I think, in so many levels is a very char challenging task. Innovate. Innovation is really uh, the 40 of the, uh, of the private sector. It's a component and it focuses on the continuous, continuous digital, digitalization and integration of government and business services online pursuant to the ease of doing business and efficient government service delivery act of 2018, where hopefully LGUs and the government agencies must streamline their bureaucratic processes and business operations using appropriate cloud-based solutions. And last but equally important is protect. And that's where uh, our friend from NPC comes in. Um, a component which focuses on cybersecurity and data privacy, which are real risks that every netizen and especially public and private enterprises must take very seriously. Uh, we only worry about this when it's too late, when we become victims. And that's the time we start worrying and start becoming aware. This CHIP framework is a good approach that both government and the private sector can apply in their digital transformation journey. To be digital ready so we can, as individuals, as an enterprise, as an industry, and as a nation compete in a fast paced and continuously evolving digital world, we will need a drastic pad paradigm shift from the high friction, hard copy, analog system of doing business to the light speed, ultra dynamic digital solutions that sets no boundaries for innovation. The technology is there for us to harness, but we must have the openness to learn to retool ourselves with new competencies and to adapt to digitized workflows that will realize sustainable growth and prosperity for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Oxales. And I am joined by everyone in thanking you
for the effective uh, moderation of this session. I also wish to thank our speakers, Attorney Navarro, Mr. Esguera, and Dr. Francisco for sharing information and analysis on data privacy, data inclusivity, and data literacy. A better understanding of these topics and the effective implementation of policies related to these matters will be essential 